Thank you for finding your seats. We're ready for the next talk now. The presentation is going to be given by Matthew French. The talk is titled Principles of System Integration. Your time. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? I'm giving thumbs up. Thank you very much. Right, first, uh, to pay the rent, uh, where, where I come from, uh, my employers who graciously let me come to PyCon and take some time off from uh, intensive projects to do this. Uh, I work for a company called FIS. Don't ask me for what FIS stands for. Um, <laughs> it's another three-letter acronym. I always get it wrong. But we are a very big company. Uh, we have 50, 55,000 employees in 52 countries. Uh, so we're actually bigger than most of our customers in South Africa, at least multinationally. Our South African office is obviously a lot smaller, and we focus on a limited subset of products. You can see here we actually have 450 different solutions that we offer, some of them in C Sharp, some of them in C++, some of them in Java. Uh, the one I ha work on happens to be called Front Arena, uh, and that uses an embedded Python, and that's the reason why I'm here with you today. All right, so when it came to deciding on a talk for this year, uh, I couldn't really think of anything interesting I'd done in Python, but I did have a long-term itch I wanted to scratch about system integration. Because this is something that should be very easy for most of us to do, and yet I find that people constantly create new ways to make it difficult. So I wanted to give a talk about that, and then Neil twisted my arm, and I created some Python examples so that uh, we can see that uh, we can solve this problem with Python actually quite easily. So what is system integration? Uh, I dragged a definition off of Wikipedia. Basically, it says you take uh, different applications, connect them together, uh, and create a system out of uh, diverse applications. For the purposes of this talk today, system integration is the process of transferring data between two unrelated applications. So we're not really talking about APIs, which is another form of integration. We're talking about how do you get data from system A to system B. Yeah? And for this talk, we're going to consider a more specific case where we're sending discrete entities in one direction. I would use the word real-time, but um, for people who use real-time Linux and do real-time processing, we, for us, real-time is in the next five seconds, so it doesn't really count. But yeah, it's soon enough for the kind of uh, interfaces we're talking about here. There are other kind of uh, integrations you can do. Um, on, the, on the one side, you have the report dump, where you take a huge extract of data and you copy it every day to another system, and the other system does something with it. The stuff I'm going to be talking about today does cover a lot of that as well. Um, some of the issues you're going to face are the same. Uh, the other um, issue is where you've got something that's more of a query service, uh, your typical RESTful interface where you have an API you connect to, you set some settings, you pull down some data. That's another kind of integration. You also encounter similar issues to that uh, that I'm going to talk about today, but the problems are different enough that I just want to focus on one particular case. All right, now I'm saying system integration is hard, uh, and to quote Jeremy Clarkson, how hard can it be? Well, actually, it isn't that hard. It shouldn't be that hard. It doesn't have to be that hard. But give it time, and we will find ways to make it hard. And that's what I want to talk about today. Okay, we have some unstated requirements with system integration. This, this is uh, from the book of the blindingly obvious. It's the things we all kind of understand and expect, but never really state out loud. Uh, first thing with system integration, when you're sending data, you expect the transfer to be reliable. You send some data from one side, you expect it to arrive on the other side. It's a requirement. We kind of expect everyone else to know that, but we don't often think about it. And the other thing is that the data must be reliable. Yeah, it's, it's great that the data got to the other side, but if it's uh, turned into something else along the way and lost all its meaning, what are we doing here? Why did we start this exercise? So what we need to do is we need to fulfill these two requirements among all the other business requirements that we have to, have to fit. The whole reason why we're doing the integration in the first place, what are we trying to accomplish? So for today's presentation, I've created a fictitious logistics company. Uh, logistics is just a fancy way of saying a mail delivery company um, uh, called Peter's Parcels. Um, this business is about delivering actual packages. You order something from take a lot, uh, gets stuck on a van, gets driven halfway across the country, and arrives at your door, maybe after stopping in several depots along the way. Um, for our example, we are responsible for the application that tracks where those parcels are. 
Okay, so uh, we need to know this because we need to know um, that there is a parcel coming, that the driver's got to collect a parcel when the parcel's been delivered. The web interface needs to have information about uh, um, where the parcel is, so when the client logs in, wants to know when the parcel's going to be delivered, we can give them some idea. All right, so that's the application we're working on. But the way the business has grown, there's a few other applications that we have to deal with. There's the customer web app where the customers log on and they request that a parcel be delivered where from, where to, how they're going to pay, they fill in all their details. So there's some web app out there. Uh, there's the driver app. So when the driver gets there, they hand you that device where you sign and it uh, logs the fact that the stuff was delivered. So that's a totally separate application. And then there's a the fleet management system. Uh, we've teamed up with matrix they can give us a real-time location of all our vehicles and where they are and that's uh, very important for us to know and keep track of where those parcels are because we know which uh, which van which parcel is on all right so great we want to put these things get them all to work together okay uh, but unfortunately the customer web app that's developed by a group of uh, snotty cs grads they don't really want to talk to anyone they think node.js is the only way to write any application they're not really interested in your problems the driver web app was written by a long timer in the industry. Uh, he really is angry that he didn't get to implement his project in COBOL. And it's just one guy working on it. So he also doesn't want to talk to you. And then the fleet management system isn't even our application. It's a third party application sitting somewhere across the internet that we're connecting to that provides us with the information that we need. So we have even less control of that. Sorry, is that uh, noise? I can hear a buzzing. Okay, all right. Thanks. Okay, so let's take our ideal world architecture. We're going to develop something. This is, uh, when I say ideal world, this is actually more current fashion because fashions over the years have changed. I have a few gray hairs. You may have noticed I've encountered many ways to do this, but this is, I believe, the current trend in how to develop an application. What you do is you have a RESTful web service sitting in your application, and the data is pushed to you when someone creates an order on the customer web, that thing is sent to you. On the driver web, when a delivery happens, you get a bit of data to say deliveries happened, and on the fleet, um, as you get real-time updates of uh, van locations, uh, you get sent to you, and it all pumps into a RESTful web interface. So, this is where we come to the Python part of the demo. And if I can just uh, find my Ubuntu virtual machine here. Oh, this is not good. Okay, there we go. So you make sure these things are working. Yeah, 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 go away. All right, so what I have here, and I'm afraid I must apologize uh, to make it readable at the back, I've bumped up the font, but I hope we're going to be able to see everything later. This here is my database. This is just a simple web service uh, that receives um, JSON uh, files that will be things, but in, in theory, think of this as our database. We're writing stuff into our relational database because we decided that was the best way to store our information. All right. To go with this, we now also have all our other applications, our whole architecture. So if we just start those up. Okay, so this here is our RESTful web service. You can watch that window here. And then these are our three applications pushing data to us. All right. Again, okay, uh, I've just created a whole bunch of random data that's being pushed through. Uh, for the purpose of the presentation, I'm just using very simple data. Yeah, but you can see here we're busy creating orders. Uh, here we have deliveries going in, and you notice all these deliveries are happening in Johannesburg, which will be important later. And the fleet tracking, we just have locations of, uh, let me just move that out the way. We have locations of different vans. All right, so, so there we go. Here are all applications running, and here's our RESTful web service. It's picking up this information as it comes through, and it'll then get written to the database. This is a lot more impressive on a big screen where you can see all of these things running together, but trust me, they all are all running together. Okay, so we have this application working. All is good. All our functionality works. It's great. Unfortunately, one day uh, we, we hit a bit of a dose of reality. Our RESTful web service goes down. Nothing to do with us because we're really good at what I do. Uh, and, and unfortunately, uh, our service provider forgot to add disks to their uh, virtual machine host and they forgot to update the SSH keys. And well, it's, uh, it's, it's a mess. Yeah, uh, things aren't working for us. So what is busy happening now in, in the background? You can see, oops, sorry, excuse me. Uh, so what is happening now in the background is these processes are busy failing. They're busy dying. They're just dropping all that information they're sending us. Okay. Now remember, we're dealing with people who aren't particularly interested 
in the data that they're sending us. They're just doing it because someone told them that they needed to send it to us. Yeah. So they don't really have any failover mechanism. They don't have any way to say what was lost, what was happening. So now we go through two weeks of hell trying to reconstruct all this information that was lost, what was delivered, what was arrived. We have to do recons and pull information out of different systems. And uh, it's, it's a complete mess. All right, you don't, don't want to do things that way if you can avoid it. All right, so that brings us to our first problem, uh, which I've decided to call enemies, because really those are uh, what they are in our world. First enemy is reality. As good as we design things, as hard as we work to make sure that everything functions perfectly and nothing could go wrong, things still will go wrong. And when it comes to integration, that's an even bigger problem because you now got another team that you have to deal with as well. You've got a whole network infrastructure you have to deal with. Yeah? I once uh, worked on a project, actually it was last year, integrating one system to another, there were 11 different teams involved in the chain. That's the reason, one of the reasons why the project took about four years. So <laughs> just getting anyone to do anything and then the next person in the chain had to do their thing and the next person at the chain. So the, the reality of your situation is something you have to cater for. Yeah, Don't just assume that because you've done everything properly, the integration is going to work. You need to cater for um, the problems that may happen. And one of the best ways to solve that is generically store and forward, which a lot of us would know as queues. Um, IBM MQ, if you're familiar with that. For this presentation, I'll be using Rabbit MQ, which is great and way better than IBM MQ, I think, but that's a different discussion. Why do we want store and forward? We're actually adding a new component into the whole system. We're creating a more complex system. Well, actually, uh, it's, it might be more complex, but it does one job and it does it very well. More importantly, with store and forward, you now have a record of all the messages that have gone through. So if you have to replay them, and your infrastructure going down is just one of your problems. Another problem you can easily have is you're getting the data, but your application is not writing the correct data. It's uh, corrupting it. So you released a bug, you put a bug into production. Now you're corrupting your data and you've been doing it for the last two days and no one noticed. And you want to replay all those messages, get everything back into sync. Guess what? With store and forward, we actually have that. We now have the capability to take those messages, replay them. Even if everything's working fine outside, something breaks, we can go into those messages and say, what went wrong? We have a huge repository of debugging and logging uh, in the actual messages that we can use to say, what's changed? What's happened? All right. So this store and forward is actually quite an important thing if you're going to build any kind of integration between two systems, especially where the messages can't afford to be lost. If you can afford to lose messages, yeah, it's maybe not so important. But if you, if you can't afford to lose messages, if it's going to take a long time to recover, you really, really want to uh, have some way to keep those messages. Right, so you can see here I've got my RabbitMQ um, dialog open. I just want to show you that it is there. I'm not making it up. Okay, we've now developed a new application. Uh, it's now slide two. And we're going to kick that off. And here's our queue listener. It's essentially the same architecture as before. Yeah, we now just have uh, three applications writing to a queue instead of writing to JSON. All that stuff is coming through. All good. We're happy, right? Everything's working. No, well, well, now we've got another problem. And that problem is complexity. Yeah. And this is kind of, I mean, this is not an integration problem. This is actually an IT problem. But because you're now dealing with two different systems, it's kind of an N squared, complexity squared problem. You, you've now got more issues. So what you want to do is you want to keep your application simple. So instead of having one listener that aggregates all of these messages and does everything, and well, why would you do that? Rather, just split them up create multiple listeners that each does a specific job well. It's the Unix philosophy. It's worked well for Unix. It can definitely work well for us. Rather, create an a little system, a subsystem that handles each one of those interfaces. Don't put everything into one big application. When you have a problem with one part of the application, it affects now other parts of the application. Just create a little system. And by the way, this is just another form of system integration. It's just at a more detailed level. All right. so. We can uh, go back to here. We can kill this. So I've now killed our application. But you'll notice that the web interface is, is still running. Uh, we're still sending messages through. We're not processing them at the moment, but they are there. So our application didn't crash. Yeah, things are going to be a bit slow for a while. We're going to take a little while to catch up. But we've solved our first problem. OK, so we've now created our next application. Of course, 
we are adding more complexity by splitting things up. And for a demo like this, why would I do this? Because this application doesn't actually do anything. But in the real world, where you've got to add a lot of functionality, a lot of logic to things, you actually want to have uh, a separation between the different applications that do real work. Okay. So you can see here, I've got my fleet tracking, I've got my customer web interface, and then here are the listeners. And if I'm not mistaken, we should get an error very shortly on one of these. Ah, there we go. Our customer listener. It's like, wait, hold on. Something's going on here. We're busy getting stack traces in our feed. What's happening? All right. While I was busy talking uh, and while we were busy working, what happened is that the people providing, uh, excuse me, the people providing our data from the customer web interface decided they want to add, add in an insurance field. This is our next enemy, change. Yeah, Stuff changes. The interfaces aren't static. The business changes. They have new requirements over time. Things happen. So they've added this new field into this interface. And we, because we decided we wanted to do things properly, we were validating the interface. We were making sure we we're only getting the fields we expect, that everything was in the format we expect. Yeah. Now this new stuff is completely, everything's breaking. We don't actually need to know this insurance stuff for now because that project is scheduled for a sprint three months from now. So we're not really concerned about it. But suddenly our production system is broken and not working. So to handle change, uh, one of the things you want to do is make sure that you don't create hard bindings for the data that you're getting. Be very permissive in what you accept. You obviously have to get the data that you expect to be there. But if there's extra data, it's not doing you any harm. Uh, unless it's uh, like another 10 megabytes per message, don't worry about it. Just let it come through. You can get to it when you need it. So don't put in validating interfaces, things that do strong type checking on the data that you're getting, because it's just going to cause you a lot of pain later. Just let things change with the flow, and you can update your side of the program later. All right. So we've now gone and fixed this application. We now have a new application that sorted this out. Unfortunately, while we were fixing that production issue, uh, another issue cropped up. We've told the company is now going national. We've just been delivering stuff in Johannesburg, but now we're delivering stuff all over South Africa. And that brings with it a whole new set of challenges. Yeah, so like I said, change is the enemy. But uh, in this case, the problem that we're going to encounter is not change. Yeah, We have our three applications again. I've now fixed the bug in the, in the previous application. Now we're sending data through. And this is the one you want to go look for, the fleet listener. OK. So here's our locations coming through from the fleet application. Now remember, this is not our application. This is sitting off-site somewhere. But we're now dealing with airlines, because we're shipping stuff via airplanes. Yeah? And the airlines don't really care about the GPS location. They're not going to send you that. Or rather, the application that's uh, got this information uh, doesn't have enough format to use. What they have is they have the airport that the airline departed from. Yeah? So your location is now not a, ge uh, a geographic coordinate. It's actually the name of a location. You also notice that the van ID has changed. It's no longer just a van number that we're getting. It is actually the registration number of an aircraft, because it's a totally different kind of uh, a fleet item we're tracking. So it's a totally different problem we're dealing with. And this is, for me, one of the most underrated problems in, uh, yeah, excuse me. No, I need to get back to my presentation. There we go. This for me is one of the most underrated problems when it comes to integration, semantics. We all understand that we get a field that says location. Yeah, it's a location. Great. But what does it actually mean? You know, where, where does that information come from? What does it imply? Yeah. So semantics are very important. You need to understand the data that you're getting, the details of what is embedded in that data. This is a very simple and very, very obvious example. But a lot of times, it's not that obvious. For example, that insurance price I gave, uh, gave you earlier, how do you know that's in rands? Could it be in dollars? Could it be in pounds? We don't know. So you've got to understand your data, what you're getting. And when you're doing the system integration, it's very important to keep track of that. All right, so you can see here, this is our, our new interface with all of these bits and pieces. Okay, finally, the last enemy, and I have no application for this because dimming, dimming it's a bit tough. But yeah, people. 
Remember, we're dealing with different teams with different requirements, different agendas, yeah? We have this nice, beautiful diagram of how the system works, but in reality, it actually looks like this, <laughs> yeah? You notice there's also an accounting system that's crept in there somewhere. It's actually very important in your life, you just don't know why yet, yeah? So this is what really happens, and th this is a people problem because everyone's got their own thing that they're working on, that they're focusing on, and they don't tell you what they're doing until the last minute suddenly becomes your problem. So it's very important to understand when you're doing integration, especially of this nature, where it's uh, different teams you're working with, that those other teams have their own problems, their own priorities, and you'll see, um, I've drawn our parcel tracker here as a nice clean architecture, but you can be sure that the people in the customer web see their nice clean architecture and think ours looks like that squirrely picture on the other side. Because we also think the other team is worse, right? It's just what we do. All right, so to wrap things up, what have we learned today? Principles of system integration. First thing is technology is only a small part of the problem. Here we're all developers, we're programmers. We like to focus on the technology. We want to talk about YAML and XML and JSON and uh, do we do this via RESTful interface or SOAP or are we going to use CORBA? For God? No, 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 let's not do that. Um, but yeah, how, what's the technology that's going to send the data across? You know, I used to do integration with sockets. It works. It's slightly harder than HTTP and RESTful interfaces, but that's not really your problem. So don't get stuck down in the technology. Get something that works, stick with what works for you. Yeah. Next step is to focus on recovery, not availability. I know when you've got a web interface, availability is be all in all. When the customer sees it goes down, it's a problem. But this is happening behind the scenes. If something is delayed by a minute, they're probably not really going to notice. So your focus is making sure that the data gets to the endpoint eventually, and um, that you can get that data back. All right. Again, there are restrictions. Sometimes the data is not that important. You can lose it, but then this wouldn't be really the uh, concept uh, for this, this talk here. The other thing, of course, is a standard programming uh, application. Keep it simple, don't be clever. I see a lot of people say, we've got all these interfaces, we should create a library that will sort out all our problems. Except that every problem is unique, and then that library just solves, ends up solving 20 different unique problems, and now you've got a bigger problem in a library that no one understands. So don't get too clever. Just keep the interface simple, uh, just uh, write standard code, solve the problem immediately in front of you, because sure enough, next week it's going to be a different problem. Okay, another rule that I try and get people to understand, source sends everything they have in a form and format convenient for them. The problem you have here is ownership. The people receiving the data are the ones who are going to own it. The people sending the data, they've just fired it and forgotten it. Yeah? So make it easy for them. I've been in projects where, as the person sending the data, uh, someone comes to me and says, we need something that matches this exact format and this exact protocol with these exact fields in it. And sure enough, two weeks later, they come back and say, throw half of those away. We're redoing half the columns because we realized we didn't get what we needed. Yeah? Don't fall for that. Just send them everything that you've got and it becomes their problem to sort out. Same thing, the recipient is responsible for interpreting the data, making sense of it, and they need to own the problem. Because at the end of the day, the recipient is the one who cares about what that data means. And they understand what their system can do with the data. Yeah. And then work with the other teams, not against them. Uh, I have had uh, occasion where two teams don't actually talk to each other. The only way anything happens is when they escalate to their manager, who escalates to their manager, and then uh, that manager goes and shouts at them and something. So the two teams actually don't talk to each other at all. Talk to each other, get to know each other, understand each other's problems, and you'll find that grease is the wheels of this integration. Things will work so much better if you do that. And the last one is use a general purpose programming language. Integration is about solving general problems. Every problem is unique, every problem is different. There's a tendency to want to create a tool that will uh, solve all your problems in a nice drag and drop way and everything will just work and uh, the programmers don't need to be involved because the analysts can go off and they just uh, put some columns in there. Never happens. There's always some issue and if you get some tool, it's going to solve 80% of your problem really well and the other 20% is just going to be the bane of your life. You're going to spend 20% uh, all your time in production trying to fix that 20%. So rather just use a general program language. And as you saw today with my demo, I just knocked that up in a, a few hours. You saw how many applications I wrote. Python works very well for integration. I must say I'm very happy with the way it works. So yes, use Python. All right. And then finally, remember there are no silver bullets. In this industry, we tend to say, ah, so-and-so said we must do things this way. This is the golden rule. Yeah, but it depends on what problem you're trying to solve. Use common sense and break the rules when you have to, at least these rules I've given you. It's not really Pythonic, because I know the golden rules of Python say almost exactly the opposite, but uh, use common sense. 
figure out what problem you're trying to solve and don't be too clever about it. Just fix the issue at hand. And that's it. If you want the code, you can mail me at that mail address. I'm not sure why anyone wants it. Uh, if you want to ask me any questions, I'm here. All right. Thank you, Matthew. That was a really insightful talk about the real world problems that come when integrating systems, right? So I'm sure you have questions. We have a lot of time for questions, so please fire away. Yeah. Hi there. Um, so just for context, I come from a, a data engineering, data science mm -hmm. uh, background. So it's with with application to that specifically. So um, you mentioned that uh, the fields, or the data that you receive, should be permissive in terms of schema and content. Correct. Yeah. So. Um, have you ever encountered um, the the need for the data to be analyzable for downstream systems? Because it seems like it's a balance to be struck for permissiveness there, versus structure. There is very much a balance, but uh, one of the fundamental problems is when you're receiving stuff from a source system, if you start to manipulate that data and try and convert it, you're actually losing context. You, you're changing the data. And if you make a mistake or if there's a uh, misinterpretation in the way the data works, you can quite often make the problem worse. By having the original source data, uh, as you will, a golden source, you know what the source system was thinking. That source system may not also be clean. I mean, bear in mind that data is often captured by people, and so that data may be garbage. But in terms of the actual schema and structure of the data, you are now getting a clean source, and you can then do conversions on that to fix it. Yes, it's very nice. It makes your, your job easier if you're receiving data that it's all in the same form. But um, pretty much every bank I've worked with has a data lake where they're shoveling lots of information into, and we were responsible for providing a lot of that information. But they didn't understand the information. And when it came time to actually use it, they realized that the information was useless to them because they never thought about what they needed. So it would have been better if we just shoveled them everything we had, and then when it came to analysis, they could pick what they needed. Right. Any other questions? Yep. Thank you for great talk. Uh, I have uh, such question. Uh, for example, we have a very bad partner, mm -hmm. and we need uh, their data. Uh, and um, usual integration, they uh, calls your API, uh, and we have many, many problems with uh, availability of our service, maybe some uh, ISP and network mm -hmm. problems. Uh, but uh, partners don't want to uh, mm -hmm. yes. re retry call, and yeah. what do we do? Yeah, look, I mean, if the data is not available, if the partner isn't willing to work with you, it is a tricky situation. Um, I have spent a fair amount of my career just badgering people until I find someone on the other side who knows how the system works and you can, you can put uh, things together. Uh, the other thing is that in situations like that, you, especially with reliability issues, you end up having to build a lot of stuff yourself to handle those failures. Yeah. So what I would normally have in that case is a gateway to their system. I'd, I'd, I'd actually split up the problem into a, an extra component. The gateway would be responsible for retrieving the data and notifying me. It's like, this is down, tell someone. You know, even I haven't done this before, but if it got that bad, I would probably write something to email them and say, we've had a failure, go and have a look. And then they'll get so bored of it, they'll actually sort out the problem on their side. But yeah, I'd, I create a gateway. Its sole responsibility is to actually get the data and manage the data and deal with the errors that I'm encountering and the problems that I'm having. And then once it gets the data, then it puts it onto a queue. And then I have an application that actually handles the business problem, the thing that we're really trying to solve. OK, makes sense. Thank you. Morning, good talk. Um, can you say a little bit more about RabbitMQ? For instance, does it have internal logging facilities? Um. Uh, unfortunately not. Uh, in, in my world, we actually have a proprietary queue, uh, queue manager, which we use. But uh, if I spoke about that, it wouldn't mean anything to any of you. Um, RabbitMQ I've used for a few small projects. As a lightweight um, uh, MQ, it's very good. It does have logging. It has performance management. It does have a lot of management tools. It doesn't really do store and forward in the way I was talking about there. What I would normally do if I was writing a full-blown application is actually have something that would read off one queue, persist it to a file system or to a database, and then write it back onto another queue. 
So I'd just be saving the stuff as it comes through. There's another big reason for doing that is you've typically got a production and test and UAT systems. And the, uh, this prod data is a great resource for testing. So what you want to do is take all that prod data and feed it through to test systems, but without it having any interaction with prod. So having that store and forward and that application in the middle, you can then, instead of receiving and writing to one queue, you can write to three queues, because you've got UAT and dev and prod all receiving the same data, and then you can test your application against multiple different types of data. Doesn't that mean that you really need store and forward at every node? No, you can create a generic store and forwards that everything passes. The idea is store and forward is really dumb. It knows nothing about the data it's passing on. It just grabs the data, records it, maybe capture some metadata because if you notice this interface that went down, you need to replay those messages. So you capture a small amount of metadata about the message. But at the end of the day, all it's doing is shoveling messages around. It doesn't care what is in them. It doesn't care whether they're JSON or XML or SOAP. It just puts the message on another key. Okay, but that means you are accepting your communications medium as reliable. For instance, running a GPS from a fleet management system is not necessarily always there. Yeah, okay, I mean, the fleet management example is a bit of a difficult one because that won't always give you data. It might go out of satellite range or um, uh, data range. It can't send you the data. But that's a function of the, that particular problem. You can't do anything about it because you're never going to get that data. If you can't connect to it, it's not going to happen. So Unless you store it on the node. Yeah, no, you can always uh, keep it and then uh, when you get data, push it forward. But again, that's, that depends on the person providing the data. If they have a reason to do that, but don't expect them to do that because that might not be the problem that they're willing to solve. Anyone else? Back there. Hey, uh, thanks for the talk. Uh, you seem very under Eve and I get a sense... Uh, you know, all these trends or uh, whatever mm -hmm. weird integration someone wants to test, you're very opinionated about it. Yes. Yeah. Um, this, is, uh, this is the industry. Yes. No, no, no. I like it quite a bit. So, um, actually, my question is to young developers. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I mean, obviously, the real answer to this is experience to, to arrive at that stage. Um, but let's say, as a young developer, you want to uh, get to a stage where, you know, you, you have your opinions and you, you mm -hmm. set about, okay, this is never going to work. Let's not spend time investigating this new trend. Uh, let's. This is the the answer. Um, so, I mean, except for good experience, or how can you hurry that that kind of mentality? Uh, yeah. Uh, that, that's actually a very good question. Um, so when I was younger, I was still opinionated. Uh, I was just more wrong. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah. You, you have to say this is the, the way to do things and then play with it and then find out that it doesn't work and why it doesn't work. So you get that experience by forming those opinions um, and uh, actually trying things out and trying to break the mold and see why it works. Yeah? I'm not actually against RESTful interfaces. They're a huge improvement on the way things were. But also being in this industry for so many years, you notice that these things come and go. They're these fads and these trends. And now everyone's got to go this way and everyone's got to go that way. Um, and at the end of the day, you're really here to solve a problem. And if you're doing it in COBOL or Python or Go, it doesn't really matter because you're here to solve the problem. But yeah, experience, you just got to live it. You got to do it. Just keep doing things. And don't be afraid to break things as well. Yeah, um, but uh, just time. Give it time. <laughs> right, we have a question here. Uh, not so much a question, more a slightly different take on an answer to the previous question. Um, instead of making the same mistakes over and over again, try making exciting new mistakes every day. <laughs> yes, uh, those are good. Unfortunately, in the early part of my career, the internet wasn't a thing, so it kind of dates me a little bit. But yeah, back then I, uh, I was always surprised to find other people making the same mistakes I was and I didn't know about it. These days, you've at least got Google. You can see if someone's got the same problem. But all that means is the problems have become more complex and more diverse. So it is a different world from when I started. But I still believe the same thing is just keep at it. Uh, just try new things. Try different things. If you've got a small application on the side, go use Go or some other application just to work on it quickly. Don't expect to do that in prod because you might then want to translate into a production system that everyone can use. But uh, experiment. Play around. Got one back here. Uh, well, two, well, I suppose more comments and questions, but actually I would appreciate your insights on them. Mm -hmm. One of the mentions we were talking just now about how to handle it when the provider of your data stops sending it or mm -hmm. et cetera. 
Would your experience suggest it's also important to have an ability to handle being sent the same data again? Because that's been ah, us a couple yeah, of times. That's actually, that's, no, that's actually a very, very good question. I mean, the talk wasn't really enough time to cover those sort of details. Uh, yes, yeah, so just a bit of digression. One um, product project we were working on, the tech lead decided we need to use extended transactions. For those of you who don't know what they are, it's where the queue manager and the database talk to each other. And when you commit something on the queue, it gets committed in the database at the same time. They know about each other. Turns out that... 90% of the failures we had were because of that XA. It wasn't solving a problem, it was creating new ones. Yeah, But you want that XA because you don't want duplicate messages. You've got a payment message to go through, you don't want the same message to go through again. So if you're in an environment where duplication is an issue, uh, and I think most of them are, you need to find some way to identify those duplicate messages and remove them. And that's one of the benefits, again, of store and forward, because you can then say, hold on, we've just got this whole bunch of messages that looks the same. You don't always catch them. Sometimes they come through without you knowing about them. People always find ways to generate duplicates without you knowing. Someone restores a, a prod database and goes back to a 10-year-old version. Now you've got 10 years' worth of history flooding into your production system. It happens. You're not going to stop there. But try and keep an ID or a date or something that allows you to know what was my last transaction. I can then ignore everything that came in before this date. Or th there are tricks you can use. Perfect. Thanks. And then one other comment, and I was just picked up by, and I was reminded when the question was, you know, as a junior developer, how do you start becoming perhaps less opinionated or at least more right? What, um, would your experience also suggest, not so much an opinionation, but would it be more important to have your data be readable by a human, if at all possible, even if that's slightly less efficient? Because I would suggest a bit of experience yes. on my side says no. it's so much easier. Absolutely. Look, I mean, it's, there might be some debates about whether XML is more readable. Um, I'm quite fond of XML, but obviously JSON is a lot easier to read, and YAML is very nice as well. Um, no, I, I, I've had to deal with binary interfaces in the past. And even now, I get text interfaces. Uh, I deal with a format called fix. You can look it up if you, if you want. Uh, the messages come in 35 equals 8. You need to know that field 35 is, and you need to know what 8 means. Yeah. So it's not a great way to get data, trying to figure out where something went wrong. What they should have actually said is, this message type is execution. That's what 35 equals 8 means and the entire message is like that oh and it's also just zero terminated so copying and pasting it is a real pain for text editors so yeah no to try keep things readable it's, it's a much better way to keep data all right we'll, we'll take one last question um yeah hi there i just have a question and point so the question is um like things like um it's particularly dealing with systems integration like i like do you consider things like conway's law and kind of these uh kind of social kind of things between teams or barriers between teams affect the system in some way? Uh, so I'm not actually that familiar with Conway's law, so now so I'm going to have to look it up. So yeah, Conway's law, it's, well, these guys will push mm -hmm. microservices like using it, but essentially these laws like um, organizations which design systems are constrained to produce designs which are copies of the communication structures of these organizations. Oh, yeah, okay, no, I am familiar with it. Um, yeah, look, that's just one part of a whole bigger organizational theory problem. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that's talking about organizations as a big monolithic entity, looking at it from a CEO's perspective. The truth is large organizations like banks aren't one big monolith. There are actually lots of little independent teams. Uh, the, the word we tend to use is silos. And you'll get one team that is really very good at what they do and another team that are afraid they're going to lose their jobs and are desperate not to make any mistakes and therefore not do anything. So it very much depends on what team you're dealing with, and you need to understand the team. It's, you can't just take a general application from the organization and say this is the way things should work. Uh, companies like Google and Facebook, they're newer. They do have this advantage where the culture has been created as they grow. But I mean, even now you see uh, stories about how internally, for example, Google is having to clamp down on some of the more fractious employees and change some of their culture to deal with the, the bigger organization. But yeah, organizational theory is a whole other <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, the topic. There, there is kind of a cross between organizational theory and kind of systems when you're developing systems and integrating systems. Mm -hmm. Do you, you feel that that does? I mean, do you feel that that's there like this? Oh, yeah, uh, yeah, no, absolutely. No, the, um, uh, again, banks are very interesting because they make up their own languages. Mm -hmm. uh, when you move between different banks, they have different words for the same thing. Yeah, and sometimes they have multiple words for the same thing in the same bank, so it can get very confusing. Uh, it's one of the reasons why I'm there, because I've now been around long enough to know what all the words mean and kind of put them in the right context. But uh, yeah, no, the, the people make up their own language and their way, own way of talking about things, and they do it differently in different places. Thank you. 
All right, that's all the time we have for questions. Thank you very much, Matthew, and everyone for coming. Thank you.